I'm Laura Palmer Noon, the Interim Vice President for Academic Affairs here at Ashford. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. You will notice I'm reading from this because I have to do some thank yous to people and I don't want to forget anybody that's been important this during the conference. It's a pleasure though to be here to introduce our closing session of the second annual Teaching and Learning Conference at Ashford University. Before I do that, I would be remiss though if I didn't thank a few very important people for their parts in making this conference possible. First, thanks to Kate Johnson, uh, our, our TLC co-chair who has worked tirelessly for months to make the last three days an engaging and collaborative experience. <laughs> special, special thanks. Whoops, I, I bumped it, Andy, sorry. I got it, I got it, I got it. I got it. Go back real quick. There okay. you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's just poetic justice, I think. All right, special thanks to the TLC steering committee made up of the faculty, staff, and leaders from across the organization who since January have been working together to plan this conference and bring it to life. Thanks to both the Iowa and San Diego Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning faculty operations teams uh, for all their hard work putting on the TLC. Thanks to BTS facilities and our vendors for an amazing job. Thanks to the Division of General Ed for sponsoring the TLC app and the College of Education for their TLC sponsorship. Uh, this marks the first year that we had welcomed students to join us as both attendees and presenters. A big thanks to Evan Gray and the CHAMPS program for helping support our student presenters. To all of our presenters and keynote speakers, thank you for celebrating a calling that brings us here as educators. Thank you for your passion for our students and for pushing us to be better at our craft. Thank you to our leaders for their support of our continuous learning and development that makes TLC possible. And thank you, all of you, to our attendees near and far. We are so happy that you could join us over the last three days with the Ashford community and our colleagues from the University of the Rockies, Bridgepoint Education, and our community po college partners. You make TLC possible. And last but certainly not least, our own Morgan Johnson, who has lived and breathed the TLC for the past several months and was instrumental in making this a huge success. Now, on to our last keynote speaker of the event, Dr. Andrew Sheen. Dr. Sheen is the Chief Learning Officer for Bridgepoint Education, where he now leads the centralization of resources across all Bridgepoint University in, collab in collaboration with academic leaders to drive greater productivity related to learning resources in order to better position and deliver even higher quality education through consistency of best practices in instructional design, innovative use of educational technology, and successful student outcomes. Can you tell that Andy wrote that for me to read? <laughs> I did, and mine would have been all incorrect grammar and stuff. <laughs> Previously, he was the Vice Provost of Curriculum Instruction at Ashford, where he was responsible for providing leadership, supervision, and direction for all academic and educational affairs of the university and related programs. Prior to assuming the position of Vice Provost, Dr. Sheen was the Executive Dean of Ashford's College of Education. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrew Sheen. Thanks, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for everybody who came here voluntarily, and then thank you to my team who came here, who were voluntold. Um, so before I begin, I, there's kind of two really important messages I take, want you to take away, kind of from a bigger ethos, and they come in the form of two quick stories. So one is, how many of you guys came and saw Dr. Levine on the first day? Did you guys see Dr. Levine? So Dr. Levine was my favorite um, doctoral professor. And uh, during that period of time, I actually uh, volunteered to come at night and film all his classes and put them up on iTunes because I was just so enamored with how he taught. And one of the things I took away from his classes, he used to always leave these quotes and he would never tell the students what they meant. And the thing that struck me is I, I really feel like he was trying to create that sense of curiosity. So that's kind of message number one is let's get curious, get to that place of curiosity. The second actually comes from an early experience I had working in the Poway Unified School District. And uh, early on in my time there, I was um, in charge of ed tech and online, and they had um, given me this goal of going to this school, Poway High School, and helping their math department go online. And um, I was getting up and giving them this talk, and I, in my mind I'm thinking, I've got them. You know, they're, they're into this, they're leaning in, this is working great. This guy stands up and he says, Andy, like, I don't really believe anything you're saying, this is total BS. And I was like kind of floored. And he said, 
I don't think you can create online those electric moments. And it floored me because I knew exactly what he was talking about. You know, and I had taught face to face and I knew it was like to feel that electricity in the room. I've been chasing those two things ever since, this idea of curiosity and electricity. And I hope if anything you get out of this, those are good things to chase. So um, quick, this is my real license picture. This is, this is how I legitimately feel every day. Since Laura introduced me, I gotta tell you a quick funny story. So when she was the interim dean of Forbes, um, at the time Craig, who's now our president, was the interim president at Rockies, and Laura calls up Craig and says, hey, do you know this Andy guy? Like, what's, what's he like to work with? I'm hoping Craig said good things, but let's just say, yeah, he's okay. Laura said, he kind of reminds me of a freshman who drank too many Red Bulls. <laughs> Case in point, couldn't have been more right. <laughs> so a couple other quick things since I, I don't know you all. Um, interesting fact, my wife and I won the Four Seasons $100,000 wedding. It's a pretty cool experience. Um, my friends and I are not the people you want with $100,000 at Four Seasons. <laughs> I'll tell you stories later. Um, I had a good bachelor life. Uh, after my honeymoon, I came home. This was my previous office, and I remember this picture from my wife. I snapped a photo of it. It said, clean this mess in all directions. End of bachelor life. So my, um, my, my heart in education is still honestly um, working with at-risk kids at a continuation high school, and it was there that I really you know, believed and affirmed this idea that education is fundamentally transformational when done well. So that's a big part of me. Um, last thing, just to be a little bit on the light side, I've really gotten into practical jokes recently, and um, my big one is I, I took this really awkward picture of myself in high school, and I framed it, and I decided to put it in people's offices. So this is actually Ross Wooder's <laughs> office, and it was in there for a month before he knew. So you'd go in there, and you'd like see pictures of his kids and his family, and then just me in high school. <laughs> this like, gave me pleasure to no end. Well, so I was like, I take it to the next level. So I started putting it in conference rooms. So you go to Bridgepoint, you have this like really important meeting, and you're like, who's that guy on the, yeah, that was me in high school. And I was like, okay, well, I gotta take this to the next level. I'm gonna start creating copies and sending it to my friends as Christmas presents. Last ornament, put it up. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> so my most recent one, which I'm pretty proud of, and I don't, I don't think Bob's here, but he actually found this out pretty fast, but this is Bob Doggerty, our dean for the school business office. That is Reagan, and I believe Franklin, and then the middle is Josh Petla and I riding a bull. So that was there for a while. All right, so into the good stuff. So three things, three things I want you to take away. Uh, and, and the reason I say three things is I believe these three things, if we were to do them really well, would set us apart, would truly be a differentiating factor for us, okay? And it's my point of view, and I certainly hope there'll be opportunities for you to ask questions, offer different points of view, but it's my take, all right? So those three things are, number one, critical thinking. I really believe you can elevate one concept, it's critical thinking, and how we do that is to ask great questions in a variety of ways. Number two is we have to lean into this ed tech revolution. The change is upon us. And my hope is that we leverage it to create those electric moments, okay? And number three is, and I'm gonna probably speak the least on this, but actually if you have to take one, take this one, it's this idea of compassion, all right? So those are the three things. Now, I'm not gonna talk the whole time, so I just, I'm prepping you right now, please chime in, offer your point of view, let's create as much of a dialogue as we can. All right, so let's start with critical thinking. So why, why critical thinking? Why would that be so important? So take a look at this Forbes article that came out talking about what are the most important skills of the 21st century. What's number one? Critical thinking. What's number two and three? What are they really? They're critical thinking. Um, I had a chance to visit uh, one of the head engineers at Microsoft a couple weeks ago. And uh, so he hires a lot of their engineers. I was just kind of curious, so like, what do you look for when you're, when you're in an interview, when you're hiring? And I'm imagining him like sifting through resumes and looking for like, you know, oh, you went to a really good school, okay, I'll, I'll put you to the top. I said, no, because you have to demonstrate you can do the job for me. So my interview would be, I would have somebody come and I would say, you've got four hours, create LinkedIn, and do it with these two peers. I wanna watch you work together and solve problems and think critically about them. That was just really powerful to me. So thinking critically is key 
for acquiring the jobs we want our students to have in the 21st century. Now this is interesting. This is a George Washington study. It says the same thing except points out something important. The idea of listening. How do we do when it comes to teaching our students to listen? Do we really do that? And how important is that? So why else? Because we are living in a, really in, in a world in which has been fundamentally transformed by technology. We are living in an information revolution. Okay? There is a democratization of information, right? That's exciting. That's a game changer. But what's the world like for somebody who thinks the internet can't lie? That's a scary place, right? What's it like to have a specific skill set that in two years is no longer relevant, right? We have to teach things that transcend. Critical thinking transcends. What about the news media? Uh, what, what, what's it like to the flip channels to four or five different stations and watch them talk about the same topic? Case in point, imagine they all talked about what Obama like when he drinks a Pepsi. Take a look at that for a second. What is it like if you're a student and you've not been yet equipped with the tools to discern what has merit and what does not? and you only watch one of those news stations. That's dangerous. Okay, we have to teach our students what has merit and what does not. Now, Dr. Levine, I will tell you, is far more bold than I am. He would get up right here if he was here, and he would tell you that our current state of education is dangerous. Dangerous. Information in, information out, didactic instruction. Take information, dump it in, take the quiz, drag it out to the trash can kind of learning. That's not good learning. He would tell you that you should read the book, The Road We Make by Walking, which is an amazing book by Pablo Freire, who Craig talked about in his keynote, and Miles Orton. If you don't know who Miles Orton is, um, he led the literacy campaigns during the Civil Rights Movement, transformational educators. And in this book, they talk about what's the mark of a great education. And you can imagine, they're debating, they're wrestling back and forth, and they say, eventually, restlessness. The mark of a great education is restlessness. And I believe that with all my heart. So it's the anti-junk shot approach. And it's this idea of restlessness. And I really think, and I'm going to quote Bill and Ted's excellent adventure here. This is what Socrates meant. Education is the kindling of the flame, not the filling of the vessel. Of course, Bill and Ted's excellent adventure um, mispronounced the name. OK, so if you're with me, and you believe that critical thinking is really important, what is it? We, um, we formed a critical thinking task force a couple years ago. And uh, to this date, it's some of the work I'm I'm most proud of it. As I look around the room, I actually see a couple people who are on that task force, Dr. Harrison, Dr. Hall, Dr. Cardenas, and others. Um, we asked this question. We asked it to 80 people, and not one person said the same thing. We did, however, get things like the definition of critical thinking is to think critically, right? But we didn't get one answer. So I promised that I wasn't going to talk the whole time. So what I want you to do now is at your table, just for a minute, I want you to turn to one another, and I want you to come up with your own definition. What does it mean to think critically? Take a minute. I want to be really mindful of time. I know that's, that's not warrant, enough time warranted to give that, uh, that question the right amount of energy. But um, we also have people on, online, so we're going to move pretty quickly. I, just, just to hear some different voices. Would anybody like to volunteer their answer? All right, right there. I think it includes being open-minded. I love it, yeah. To be open-minded you have to be able to consider different points of view, right? And you can't have your own bias clouding everything you hear, right? So there's a lot in that idea of open-mindedness. I love it. And that doesn't mean everything is true, right? You have some element of being able to determine what has merit.
but you're open to different perspectives. I love it. Let's get one, one other. Right here, yep, Anna. So I had basically said uh, BS detection, <laughs> or being able to differentiate between different pieces of information and have a thoughtful reason for why one is more credible than another. See, I, I love, so let's just combine them together, this idea of open-mindedness, you can consider different perspectives, monitor your own bias, and then also have some kind of tools in which to determine which has more merit or which does not. A uh, faculty member in Clinton said the same thing, though. So it's a bullshit detector. That's the definition of critical thinking, which I like a lot. Now, we went and asked scholars in the field what it meant. Um, the first was Dr. Rod Sims, uh, an amazing Australian accent. Ba basically, everything he said sounded smart. So his definition, of course, was great. Um, I'm not going to read the thing to you. I just want to point out one thing. It's this idea of a quest, right? A quest. It's not like one day you wake up and you get in the mail this like certificate and you're like, you did it. Like you're a critical thinker. Like congratulations. It's a quest. You can always improve the quality of your thought. So key. Now Paul and Elder, um, we went to their conference. It was amazing. Uh, it was just one of these kind of experiences I can't even tell you. If you're a critical thinking uh, geek like me, this is a great conference to go to. If you Google critical thinking, you're going to find a lot of great resources on Paul and Elder. I think their definition is perhaps the most tight and concise. I'm going to point out two things here. One is the art, right? Teaching and learning is a science, but it's also an art. Art is messy. Back to restlessness, right? Uh, Dr. Harrison, if, if he's here, he asks a great question. He says, um, is Dexter a good or bad guy? That's kind of messy, isn't it? I kind of might stir some restlessness in you if you really had that question, right? So, so art. Two is you think about your thinking with the view to improve it. Do we do that enough? Do we teach our students to do that enough? I love that definition. Now, I'm going to tell you a personal story to unpack Brookfield's theory. Some of you have heard me tell this story before, so brace yourself. So when my wife and I um, first met, she eventually brought me out to see her, her family. And if you know anything about um, the Sheens and my wife, Erin, the Aldriches, they are on polar opposite spectrums of the political world. Okay, so the Sheens, we kind of yuppie, shiftless, kind of grew up on a Buddhist commune for a couple years. Aaron's family were, you know, they worked for Ross Perot. I mean, they're very Dallas, very. So I come in, and I, the first thing I think when John, my wife's um, father, sees me is this is not who I expected Aaron to bring, my wife, my, my daughter to bring home for Christmas. That was the first thought. Second thing is my wife said, do not, whatever you do, do not get in debate with my dad about politics. So if you know anything about me, like that's, that's impossible. Like he's going to say something and I'm just, I'm going to go in, I'm going to go for it. So first night was pretty good, pretty tame. Um, to give you an idea of how much John's loving me though, we're a very traditional family, so slept on different sides of the house. I went to give Aaron a hug good night. So I give her a hug and I see John in the back and he goes, ugh. So John's loving me. <laughs> so um, second night, you know, we're at dinner and, and in Aaron's family, no one argues with John. You don't, you don't argue with John. Um, he's like the man of the house. And uh, so he starts going, going, saying crazy stuff, in my opinion. And I'm like, I, I got to go there. And at one point, he was like standing over me, like pointing his finger down at me. My wife, and my wife now is like, no, dad, no. And <laughs> it's bad. Years later, we've accomplished absolutely nothing in our, in our debates. We're basically waiting for the other person um, to be done talking so we could talk. It often ends in like shouting matches. And I, and I thought about Brookfield's definition, and if, what if we could really kind of equip our students, and myself, and John, with tools to not do that? And so I thought, okay, what about this idea of context? What, where's John coming from? Like, how did he arrive at that opinion? Now, I never knew that John grew up in the foster system and had a pretty tough upbringing, but he made it. He's a successful businessman. And that doesn't mean he's wrong or right. But he believes that everybody, regardless of circumstance, can make it, right? Not wrong or right. That's just his story. That's his context, right? Well, he doesn't know that I grew up in poverty. And uh, when my parents got divorced, my mom was a um, single mother. Um, we had to have government help to eat. My mom went at night um, to school to become a nurse. Uh, her getting her degree changed my life, changed our life, which is why, in part, I came to Ashford to try to do the same. Um, but he didn't know that that was my story. That was my context. So I believe, right, that a little help can go a long, 
go a long way. And it doesn't make either of us right. It just means that if we were to really take the time to understand each other's context, we might be able to listen to the point of view and check our own bias and be reflective of our own thinking. And I think if we were to do that, eventually John would realize that I was actually right all along. <laughs> you know, I, tr I really do mean I wish I didn't mean it, but I sort of do mean it. But anyway. So, okay, so back to practical jokes. So um, John's 70th birthday is coming up. I was really fortunate. Thank you to Forbes School of Business for inviting me um, to hang out with Steve Forbes. I brought John along. He's a big fan. That's him. Uh, snapped a picture. But you know what John's getting for his 70th birthday? Yes, you know it. <laughs> Framed. But put it in his office without telling him, and just friends will come by. Like, wow, I never knew John was a Hillary fan. Be furious at me. So I'm going to move a little quick here because I want to get to some of the other stuff. But, um, but, so, but stay with me. Um, couple quick other things. So, so first is we have, to, we have to instill in our students this idea of unpacking what it means to think critically. Stephen Brookfield, when he came out and visited us, um, had a cup of tea, which was amazing, had an earring, which was amazing. The whole thing was like, his, I wanted to just hug him. It was like everything I wanted him to be. Um, he said, you have to make critical thinking less esoteric for your students. In other words, you have to make it sensible. And, uh, and a tool we can do that is to use images and really talk about it. So I use these three images. They're the three stages of reflective thought. Stage one, right, would be captured by this image. Why this image? What does it mean? Let's blurt it out. Yeah, following in everyone else. It's like the anti-BS detector, right? Like a deer in a stampede. If you're all going that way, I'm all going that way. We don't want students to be this, all right? We want them to move them past stage one. Stage two, reflected by this image. Why this image? Yeah, yeah, on, on the fence to your open-minded. I can be on both sides of the fence. So for my wife, what would it be like to be able to hear both my point of view and John's point of view and to consider them and then again eventually land on me being right? <laughs> what, what about stage three? So I'm a huge Star Wars fan. So this is like the Yoda of critical thinking. There's a sense of wisdom, right? Not the decapitated owl that it looks like in the in the picture, but you can see up, you can see down, you can twist your, all your head around, right? You can see from all these viewpoints and you have this sense of wisdom. We want our students to graduate with this. I, I believe, and I don't want to come off too strong, but I, but I believe it, so I'm going to say it. I think we can be truly special here at Ashford and at Rockies. I think we can create an environment that truly engulfs students in this idea of thinking well, of thinking critically. And I think it's up to us to really embrace it. And I, I think of other schools that have done it. How many of you in, in San Diego here, have you been to High Tech High? That's a school that's done it. If you walk into the front doors of High Tech High, you will look up and you will see this, these words. I just captured me to no end. I mean, really, it inspired me. I grabbed a picture of it. I chose, of all the words they could choose, they chose ask why. I love that. Imagine all these students walking in and seeing that, being inspired by that. I love it. Well, we, um, our critical thinking task force, we had to kind of figure out a mantra. So we're like, well, what can we do? That's John Dewey, by the way, in the background. Well, we were brought back to the words that Dr. Levine shared with us. He said, so often, students come to their, to their educational environment, and that can be admissions counselors, that can be advisors, that can be professors, it can be anybody. And they're coming almost demanding, right? Teacher, professor, advisor, et cetera, teach me what to think. Teach me what to think. Never imagining, never never dreaming that what they really should be doing is saying, teach me how to think. Teach me how to think. So we cross off the what and we put on the how. And that's really something that I think is important. So OK. So if you're with me and you think it's important and we talked about what it means and we have this opportunity, how do we do it? And I can do it a lot of ways. But the way that I'm going to cue on today for the next you know, five minutes is we can do it by asking great questions. This is not a great question, OK? This is not a great question to ask. And I have done it in my own classes. And I believe if you're here and you're honest, you have done it too. What happens when we ask a question like this? What's an input? What's an output? Respond to two peers in our classroom. What happens? Not much. Is a lot of thinking going on? Yes, great job, Newton. That's exactly what I think too. That's what an input is. Yes, Steve, great job. I love it. That's what an output is. There's not much thinking going on. I, I want us all to commit today not do this anymore. Okay, this is not great thinking. Okay, let me show you what is though. Take Bloom's. Knowledge comprehension questions are not bad. They're just incomplete. All right, there's a place for them. 
but we can't stop there. We've got to go up the ladder of blooms. So let's take an example. Let's imagine that our students read this article. Pretty controversial article. Should stir up some restlessness, some energy, some controversy, right? And then instead of asking them things like this, who or what is the JCC, or in the 1990s, how much did they pay out to individual claimants, right? What would happen if we asked those questions? By the way, would you have to read the actual article? No, you'd skim it, you'd find the answer, you post it, boom, done. Very little thinking's happening. What happens if you ask this question? Read that for a second. Would you be interested in what your peers had to say about that? Would you be motivated beyond just a grade? Would you think about it when you logged off the computer? Yeah, would you feel a sense of restlessness? I think you would. And we don't have to stop there. What about that? Imagine the professor going in and asking other questions, furthering the conversation, deepening the learning, having real dialogue. Gosh, that would be amazing. We can do that. Now, that's kind of heady. Let's just take a simple look at it. What if we just asked in a really simple way, if simple questions provoke thinking and some do not, which of those causes you to think and which do not? Although for me, the shower one, um, I can't fully remember, so it'll be a little bit more for me. Just kidding. Aaron, if you're watching this, just kidding, I showered. Um, what about if we ask those questions to ourselves? What if we live this idea of asking good questions? I want you, as I, again, I don't want to talk the whole time, I, just for a second, read those questions and reflect for a second. Are we guilty? Maybe of this, or, or how about this? Would some of you have a different point of view than maybe I have? Maybe you think there's a good reason for guidance. Maybe I do not. Maybe you think we should focus on APA as much. Maybe you do not. But we should ask these questions. We should be constantly asking these questions and debating, right? So we should ask questions. We should live it. Let me, let me sum up um, in, with this. And I, I, can't, I can't say it better than this, so I'm just going to read it. Questions can be like a lever used to pry the stuck can of a lid on a paint can. If you have a short lever, we can only just crack open the lid on the can. But if we have a longer lever or more dynamic question, we can open up the wider and really stir things up, restlessness. If we have the right question applied, it digs deep enough, then we can stir up all the creative solutions. Great questions do that. Bad questions do not. So our task force, I'm going to move quickly here. Our task force came up with one other concept that I want to share with you, which is you have to ask a great question but then you have to ask it in a variety of ways, right? So even a great question in the same format again and again and again can create that automaton feeling. We don't want that. So here Dewey says, when cast in a mold and runs dry in a routine way, we lose its educative power. So these are other ways we can frame great questions um, that can continue to get students engaged. So I'll just show you a couple. So first is image analysis. If you were a student and you walked into like your second or third discussion and you had something like that, wouldn't that engage you? Couldn't you see how different points of view or ethnicity or age might play a role in how you'd answer that question? What about that? Would that stir in you a little bit of energy or emotion? Wouldn't you want to answer that question? What about something simple like this? Hey, what's happening here? We have to take some time to think about that. I love this one, debate. Let's just take two points of view from newspapers on the same article, put them out there. Let's ask students, which one's right? I'm going to end with this, and you know, Einstein says it better than I do. He said, if I had to solve a problem, and I had an hour to do it and my life depended on it, I'd spend 55 minutes figuring out what the right question is, and then I'd spend the rest five minutes solving it. That's pretty powerful to me. Now, I hope you don't feel like this at this point, because that's just one of two, but I'll, I'll move pretty fast through the other two. All right, so that's critical thinking. To sum it up, ask great questions in a variety of ways, stir that restlessness. Two, the ed tech revolution. It's upon us. It's upon us. And things are changing fast. How many of you remember this phone? Right? I remember my mom had this phone. I felt like it would be like an hour. She'd have to like set up the satellite like with a tire on the road and it would, you know, it would never work. All right, we went from that to that. Pretty fast that happened. Right? Every seven months it seems like there's a new phone coming out. By the way, I hate the iPhone's new interface, I don't know about you guys, it's driving me crazy. Um, we went from Mario Brothers, just sidebar, I went and bought uh, an old school Nintendo because I had to play Mike Tyson's Punch-Out 
Um, but like after five minutes, it was so slow and boring because I'm so used to like current media. And I was so bummed out. Um, but so we went from that to that. Guys, this is where it's going. And I have to play this just because this is me doing virtual reality. And it's really <laughs> awkward. A couple years ago, would anybody imagine that virtual reality is going to be hitting us in the way that it is? This blew me away. I mean, it's just really strange, I know. But virtual reality is here. <laughs> in two years, where is it going? It's almost hard to pay attention with me. This is where it's going, in my opinion. We're going to like Star Wars kind of stuff. So we have to lean in. Now, I, I want to make this connection, though. I want you to imagine you're a student. And you're immersed in this world where you hear things like artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and you hear commercials about online learning that almost put forward this idea of like educational, like digital utopia, right? Let me give you an, an example and talk to you why I think there's a disconnect here. I stand before you today to apologize. The system has failed you. I have failed you. I have failed to help you share your talent with the world, and the world needs talent more than ever, yet it's being wasted every day by an educational system steeped in tradition and old ideas. Well, it's time for a new tradition. It's time to realize talent isn't just in schools like this one. It's everywhere. It's time to use technology to rewrite the rules of education. To learn how you learn so we can teach you better. It's time a university adapted to you rather than you adapting to it. It's time, time, time for a different, different kind of university. It's your time. Ashford. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so what happens when a student is living in this kind of technology revolution and then, um, you know, has this commercial that's painting this picture of this environment and they go into one of our old classes that's flat, paper under a glass, scrolling, long periods of scrolling. What's that, what, what happens emotionally? What happens? Duped, disconnect, disappointed, right? So the look and feel really matters. Now I don't want to embarrass Jorge in the Forbes School of Business, but, but I maybe will a little, which is this course that you're seeing this difference, this Business 330, this is what we can do. We can do better than this. Um, this course just won an award. Um, Jorge, what, what award was it? Yeah, they won a, it's going to be a press announcement coming out, so super proud of the Forbes School of Business for this course. But the power, right, that this visual difference can make, more modern, more aligned with the world that students are living in. Arthur C. Clarke said, when students are engaged, learning happens. The look and feel of the course creates some of that engagement. Now I'm going to talk a second about our LMS that's coming, I think, and help us with this. We have to do a lot of work to make sure the aesthetic look of the course is good. I will say, and with all my, my heart, I believe that 2017 is going to be a year that we break through. I think that we have all of the technology tools. I think we have the teams. I think we can really be set apart. We've got tutoring on demand. We have an incredible media team that's really, really evolving the way we do media. We signed a two-year contract with UCU. We can overhaul forums. We've got Portfolium and we've got Constellation team that's got a great roadmap with there. I and mean, we've on and on and on. We have all the tools. It's up to us to really leverage them well to set ourselves apart. And I'd say kind of where we're at, my opinion is, I'd say right now, we've done a great job in the past of, of going through and creating like overview videos and, and assignment videos and more static content. And I think we're starting to move into more kind of more dynamic. I think where we need to go is to lean into this revolution and even stretch ourselves further. And I want to challenge us all to constantly assess ourselves, to constantly assess what we're doing and what works. We can't get too into the hype. Right? We have to be very mindful of what actually works versus what the hype says works. Right? Some may be true, worth the hype, some may not. Let me give you a case in point. So I don't think Cynthia is here, but I want to give her credit. She did some great research. Uh, Dr. Justin Harrison came to the President's Cabinet recently, talked about this as well. 
Um, all of our videos are in Kultura, and so we can track all the usage, right? And what we find here is, and what you're seeing is data that's tracking the intro videos of each course in each week. What's happening? What's happening in this, this slide? What do you see? It's decline. So students are going into the first week. They're really excited. They're really engaged. And then what? It just tapers off. That doesn't mean that doing intro videos isn't, isn't meaningful or isn't getting the biggest bang for the buck. But we should think maybe just differently about it. Maybe we do it in the first week, and we give a whole overview of the course. And then we focus our energy on assignment-specific videos going forward. Or we think of that point of need, that just-in-time, Bob referred to it today on the panel, that just-in-time learning. That's where we place the media objects. And I know the library team is here. They've done a great study where they went and found out where the biggest problems exist in courses relative to what students are asking the help desk. They went and plugged a library asset. Help desk calls shot down like this. So we know through evidence this works. So I would challenge us not to abandon the weekly videos, but to just start to evolve them a bit more and start to focus more on where that point of need is. right? And if we assess ourselves constantly and we're assessing what we're doing, and I, I think that that's going to lead us to greater outcomes. And then I'd say, let's keep pressing forward. Let's keep trying to push to that bleeding edge and do more things like scenarios and authenticated situating learning. All right, now I'm trying to come from a point of inspiration, but there is like a what if we don't. Like what if we don't? I don't know about you guys, but how many people here thought Blockbuster like seven, eight years ago would ever be bankrupt? I thought they were going to move into my backyard and like set up shop. Like it was like Starbucks. You could not drive anywhere and not see a Blockbuster. What happened? Yeah, they got, they got beat by people who figured out new ways to do things. We can't be Blockbuster. We have to be like the people at Netflix who didn't just rest on their laurels after they beat Blockbuster. They're continuing to innovate. I was talking with Dr. Jeff Hall today, and he was sharing like how Netflix is now doing their own TV shows and their own movies. They're building. The, they haven't stopped. They innovated, and then they keep innovating. So we can't rest on our laurels. We've done a great job here at Ashford and Rockies, but don't stop. Keep going. How about the Walkman? I mean, I don't know. About, I, this is crazy to me, but about, you couldn't run with this because it would skip the CD player. But gosh, it was better than the cassette player. I remember I, this is going to be kind of maybe a little bit embarrassing, but I am a huge Cure fan. And when I got Just Like Heaven, I, that, um, there's a song on there that I, I played literally again and again. But I have to wait like four minutes to rewind it to like hear it again. So the Walkman was amazing. And then you had you know, the, the iPhone, and, and then poof, Walkman's gone. I don't know, you guys may have seen, a, seen a, a CD Walkman in a store recently? It's not, it's not there. It's gone, right? What about Kodak? Who thought Kodak would go away? And that's crazy, right? So we have to continuously evolve. The good news is that on top of all of this new technology that we've embraced and we're testing out is we finally have a learning management system that I think is going to be a message that's worth sending. And I, Mike Kalaji, if you're, you're listening, he used to always say your medium is your message. And I really like that. So if you think about e-college, what, what's our message? So um, I have to give Anna a shout out. She sent me this video recently. And I, I just I have to play it for you. Um, because I don't know if you guys watched the Apple Super Bowl commercial long ago that really kind of caused Apple to take off. Well, this is Canvas's version of that. And then I'm going to play you another one, which actually kind of highlights some of what Canvas can do. The third glorious anniversary of our commitment to the legacy of our chosen learning management system. We have successfully maintained the status quo. Protected by the safe, enclosed system that is keeping us secure from the variances of innovation and foreign technologies. Divergence from the complexity we have embraced will only lead to idleness. We are one people. One win. One resolve. One cause. Our LMS is sufficient for our needs. Ah! We must resist change.
All right, a little extreme, but <laughs> if those of you who, you know, there's a few of us, like we, working with eCollege was such a bear. When I watched that, it was like literally, it was like, yes, this is it. So our new LMS is a message, right, that's worth sending. Our old one, I don't think so much. And what I love about it most is that you all selected it. We had over 225 people partake in the Canvas um, webinars, and you rated it the highest. And our LMS steering committee, we picked it. And, uh, and, I, and I just believe that this next kind of year is going to be challenging. It's not easy to migrate. If you think an LMS, it's like the heart, and everything's attaching itself onto it. It's a pretty big undertaking. I, I couldn't, can't help but just give Chris Russo, Josh Petlotron, and all the other people who have been leading this effort a shout out. It's a big change management effort. But like you see up there, it's worth it. So I want to give you a couple nuggets, though, for the LMS um, that I'm going to highlight with a video teaser. But the way I think of it is, how many of you um, have read Anna Karina? So Tolstoy, in the first part of the book, says this, happy families are all alike, but every unhappy family is different in its own way. So what did he mean by that? Now, my guess, and the Anna Karina principle is based off this, is that we met is that happy families balance these kind of essential elements. So good, good sex life, work-life balance, money, sleep, etc. All those sort of things you sort of keep in a good balance. Any one of those things can cause you to be unhappy. So the way that I view that to the LMS is like, what are the essential elements of a good LMS or Canvas that are going to make our students and our faculty and our entire group happy? So the first is that it's open. Now, this is e-college integration, a closed system. This is what I like to think about when I think of what it's like to integrate all these tools with e-college. So four months is the average time it took to integrate a tool with e-college. Um, OK, this is Canvas. <laughs> four hours. Four months, four hours. This is pretty amazing. That's an current principle. Um, now, I don't have time today to go through an exhaustive list, but what I do want to do is I want to play you a video and, uh, and, and, and give a huge shout out to Anna, who's here, um, Lindsay, who's the voiceover, and then um, also to Josh Cohen, if you're listening, went above and beyond to put this together really fast. We are going to start uh, a series where we're going to send little highlights in the form of video out to our staff um, and our faculty and et cetera to kind of get them excited about what's possible. So you guys get a chance to preview um, the first version. This won't be quite as controversial as the, the last one. Here at Ashford University and the University of the Rockies, we're committed to providing an innovative learning experience for our students. This includes ongoing improvements to the classroom environment that facilitates their education. In 2017, this commitment will take the form of the transition to Canvas, a new learning management system that will host all of our classrooms and provide opportunities for students and faculty to wait for it. Here at Ashford University and the University of the Rockies, we're committed to providing an innovative learning experience for our students. This includes ongoing improvements to the classroom environment that facilitates their education. In 2017, this commitment will take the form of the transition to Canvas, a new learning management system that will host all of our classrooms and provide opportunities for students and faculty to expand how they interact with the educational environment and with each other in dynamic new ways. Canvas is an open, cloud-based environment designed around ease of use and access for students and instructors. From internet-enabled computers and mobile devices, you'll be able to engage in the classroom in ways that better integrate with your daily life. The Canvas mobile app, available for free in both the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store, allows students and instructors to participate in all areas of the classroom, from discussions, to quizzes, to reviewing grades. The online classroom connects instructors and students to their colleagues and classmates around the globe. 
With Canvas, we'll be able to expand that connection to each other. Built into the classroom are unique tools that allow audio and video recording directly in the browser. We'll be able to go beyond a text-only interaction and put a voice and face to the name of our classmates and instructors. The accelerated classroom environment is fast-paced and deadline-heavy. Knowing when something is due is critical to planning for success. Canvas provides a calendar that populates all of your due dates across the course and helps manage the day-to-day -day requirements of the classroom. In Canvas, you can get course notifications whenever you like through your email and mobile devices. If you want to include your school calendar on your mobile device, the classroom calendar can be exported so you can view it side by side with your personal calendars. You can also customize how you would like to be alerted about other events, such as grade posts, course announcements, or a new discussion post in a thread relevant to you. The way we see it, the world is your Canvas. Stay tuned in the coming months as we share additional features of Canvas and provide training opportunities so that everyone is ready for this exciting transition. We look forward to the opportunities in store for all of us. What'd you guys think? You like it? All right. Nice job, Anna and others. All right. So winding down, um, I think if we can really embrace critical thinking and ask great questions that stir restlessness, and I think if we lean in to this ed tech revolution and create that electricity, and now that we have the tools and the platform, we're positioned to do it. And there's one more thing, though. And I'm going to spend the least time on this, but actually I think this is maybe the most important, this idea of compassion. So I want to tell you kind of a personal story. You know, I left um, higher ed at a traditional university, and I, I felt like I wasn't living my calling. So I quit, and at the time, um, I remember the person saying, like, you're, you've got this. You're in higher ed. You're on this tenure track. Like, this is, why would you ever leave this? And my heart wasn't there. So I, I decided to make a leap, and I went to teach at-risk kids at a continuation high school. And uh, it changed my life. It changed my view on education. And my second year in, though, um, I, had, I was named the High School Teacher of the Year. I was the Power Unified School District Teacher of the Year. I'd won some national awards. And I got a pink slip. And I got a pink slip because the budget crunch hit, and, uh, and I wasn't tenured. And on top of that, the, um, the girl I was living with for three years, and I had kind of a brutal breakup, and I basically had a broken heart. And I remember thinking there were times where I didn't really want to get up in the morning. And I, I started to kind of get bitter. And I remember thinking, well, forget this. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, I'll just forget education altogether. And I was driving one day to, you know, to teach my class, and I kind of had this epiphany. And it was like, wow. So it reminds me of this Brookfield quote. So, wow, like, maybe not exactly the same, but this is how a lot of our students, not all, but a lot of our students feel every day. What's it like to not know where you're going to find money to pay the next bill? What's it like to be my mom? and have to leave your kids at night to go to school and have a sitter and not see them grow up. What's that feeling like? It kind of felt a lot like I felt. It was really hard to be there every day, right? What kind of educator do you need to be when you're working with students like that? You need to have a big heart. And so I decided that I wasn't going to be bitter, that I was going to lean in all the way. And I watched the movie Freedom Riders. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but I said, I'm, I'm going to be Aaron Grumrall. And I brought a Holocaust speaker in, and you know, we did the, I worked a part-time job at night. I, all the money I made, um, I paid for books. I gave it to my students. I was all in. And um, this particular trip that I did, to repeat Aaron Grumble's story, was to take these at-risk kids, because a lot of them had never traveled outside of San Diego, let alone be on a train or anything. So I, I, I brought them on the train. And yeah, we actually had to take a bus to the train, and it only could hold so many students. And they had to be there at 5.40 in the morning to make it. If you know anything about an at, at-risk population, 5.40, like, you're maybe getting like 20%. That's what I was betting on. Every kid showed up. And that's great, and oh my god, there's not enough room on the bus <laughs> for all the kids. So I paid for taxi cabs out of my pocket for all these students to go to the museum. My principal caught wind. And he, you could imagine, he was, and rightfully so, he was furious. And it was one of these life-changing experiences. I can't even begin to tell you the stories that happened on that day. 
But I got back, um, and I remember doing snow angels on the grass. It was in the snow in San Diego. It was completely hot outside. But I was like that happy. We made it back like all in one piece. My principal comes up to me, and he, his eyes were furious. And he looks at me, and he goes, you have to wrap your mind around your heart. To wrap your mind around your heart. I actually want to tell you, though, and, but I'm not saying, by the way, to go take kids on a field trip and pay for a cab and not private. I'm like, not telling you that. But I want to say the exact opposite. I want you to wrap your heart around your mind. That, I think, is the most important message of today. And, and I promise you this. Sagatra Mitra said, if a computer can replace a teacher, it should. No computer will replace Jaime Escalante. Nobody can do that level of inspiration, that level of care. Nobody could do you know, what, what I felt like I could do with those kids because I had embraced this idea of empathetic instruction. So let's all be Jaime Escalante kind of educators. And I believe with all my heart, if we have this idea of critical thinking, we ask great questions that stir restlessness, we lean into the end tech revolution, we create those electric environments, and we have big hearts, a lot of compassion, we are going to create an educational experience that's set apart. So I'm going to end where I began with a Dr. Levine quote. He said this. He said, science is built of facts the way a house is built of bricks. But accumulation of facts is no more science than a pile of bricks is a house. Okay, what he means by that is you can string courses together and you can equal a degree, but it doesn't mean you're offering an education. We're going to offer an education here. Thank you. Before I leave, though, uh, just on a more funny note, um, our learning services team has this tradition now where we play um, a hole in the wall um, with uh, you know, different themes. So I present to you on a lighter note, Ashford High School hole in the wall. Michael, if you're watching, thank you for doing yet another hole in the wall video. So on a lighter note, if you got to go, I understand, but this is funny. We don't need no thought control No dark sarcasm in the classroom Teach a leave them kids alone Please do me a favor, though, and th thank you. But really, I, I, if you would all just stand up for a second with me, and I want you just to turn to this TLC team, and I want you to give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.